Jesus the God-man, that's the theme. And in this gospel, John presents, as I explained last time, John presents three strands, if you wish, three themes which he kind of intertwines throughout his entire gospel. I mentioned this at the beginning because if you understand this idea, you know, it'll put the entire gospel into context. You'll understand, oh, this is what's happening here. Oh, this is what's happening here. He always repeats the same three uh, themes. I'm going to go over them. So strand number one, as I said, is the presentation of Jesus as the divine Son of God who has come in the flesh as Jesus Christ. Now what's interesting is the other gospel writers, you know, they, they tell you the story and, and if you're reading it, slowly but surely you're coming to the conclusion, wow, this Jesus person it must be really special. You know? and, and you're starting to get the idea that he's special and, and then as you read through the other gospels, the idea is you come to the conclusion, well, this, this must be the Messiah, this must be the Son of God. John does the exact opposite. He states it right at the beginning. In the very first chapter, he says, you know, Jesus is the Son of God, and then he goes about. So he does his, his proof, if you wish, uh, in reverse. Uh, he calls uh, Jesus the Word, and he explains that Jesus, the divine Word, created the world, and then, amazingly, entered his own creation. You know, we're so used to the idea of Jesus, the Son of God, especially if you've grown up in the church or you've grown up you know, in a Christian environment. We're so used to that concept. You know, it doesn't kind of phase us. We, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. But here they were explaining something which was like mind bending. You know, what? God created the world and then took on human flesh in order to enter into His own creation. That was truly a radical, uh, incredible, uh, thing. The next, so that's one strand. He's always talking about Jesus the God-man. Another strand is belief. John briefly mentions in his prologue that some believed that Jesus was God and that belief led to life and uh, truth. So the idea is that you know, one of the strands, one of the ideas is that people hear this message and you, you see how they believed and how that faith affected their life. And then strand number three, of course, is the opposite, disbelief. So in the prologue, John also mentions that even though Jesus provides proof or witness uh, of His identity uh, to His people, the majority of them don't believe. So that's another strand, another theme that runs through the, through the gospel. Now, as I said last week, John takes these three ideas, Jesus the Son of God, belief and disbelief, and he weaves these three together as he shows Jesus in you know, various situations, teaching, performing miracles, and the reactions of disbelief and belief. So this, is, this whole theme repeats itself throughout the book. So, and I'm just reviewing what we did last week here. So, once he set forth the pattern for his gospel, chapter 1, 1 to 18, he starts with the introduction of a major New Testament character, and that is John the Baptist. So John the Baptist actually serves as the first individual who believes. Remember I said some believe and some disbelieve? So if you're wondering who's the first one in the book of John to believe, John the Baptist is that individual. So let's get a little bit of background on John the Baptist. I think we're all familiar with him. Uh, some say, well, you know, why, why do we call him that? Because that's what, that's what Jesus called him. Jesus is the one that called him John the Baptizer in Matthew uh, chapter 11. So John the Baptist, again, a familiar uh, biblical character, second cousin of Jesus. Mary was the cousin of Elizabeth, who was John's mother. Elizabeth and Zacharias, his father, were very old. They had no children when an angel appeared to Zacharias while he, appeared, uh, while he ministered rather, at the temple. He was a priest. They had lots of priests in uh, Israel uh, at that time. They couldn't all serve at the same time, so they would be selected by lot. A priest you know, could go a whole life without ever serving, never get picked. So it was quite, a, quite an honor uh, to, to, to have your name picked so that you could go minister at the temple. And this was the case with Zacharias. We know that an angel announced that his wife Elizabeth would conceive 
and have a child, and that child would be named John, that's where we get his name. And we also know that from an early age, John was set apart for special ministry, which as he grew, was defined as one who prepared the way for the Lord. We, you know, it's, this idea is brought up um, continually as we read about John the Baptist. And of course, this was in accordance with what the angel said about him and what the Old Testament said would happen. This is the important part. What the Old Testament said would happen before the Messiah came. Very, very important. According to the prophets, uh, Malachi specifically, chapter three, verses one to three, God would send a messenger, a prophet, in the spirit or in the style of Elijah to announce the imminent coming of God's Messiah. That was a prophecy. And it was a prophecy that was eventually fulfilled through John the Baptist. So John and his ministry were the fulfillment of that prophecy, that promise from God. And what was sad about the fact that the Pharisees and the priests and the leaders rejected John the Baptist was they were the ones who were supposed to know about this prophecy. They were the ones who were charged with preparing the people you know, for John the Baptist. And obviously, uh, you, as we know, they were the main antagonists. You know, they were the, the main enemy uh, of this. So John, uh, the gospel writer, puts John the Baptist as the first example of one who believed. Jesus had not taught or performed miracles before his baptism, so John's faith or John's belief in, um, in Jesus were based on a special sign that God would give him. You know, so John is, John is growing up and he has uh, you know, visions from God, he has you know, uh, the Spirit, uh, is training him, so on and so forth. And the main question is, okay, I'm supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the forerunner, but who, who's the, how am I going to know who the Messiah is? You know, how am I going to know? And anybody, what was the answer to that? How would he know? Anyone? I'll give you an extra an hour of sleep. <laughs> well, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 33, we'll read it later, uh, John says that God revealed to him that the one over whose head a dove would appear after their baptism, that would be the one. I mean, how many hundreds, maybe thousands of people did John baptize? And yet he was always baptizing, of course, obeying you know, the Spirit, but he was also baptizing with a hope. One day I'm going to see, you know, God will give me an unmistakable sign of who the Messiah is. Now we know that this is exactly what happened when Jesus was baptized as a signal to John, among others. And it's, you know, some people say, why did Jesus have to be baptized? And we're also, we're, we always answer that question with the idea that, well, Jesus had to be baptized to fulfill righteousness, or Jesus had to be baptized to demonstrate that He too was looking forward to the kingdom, or Jesus had to be baptized because, well, God commanded all good Jews to be baptized in preparation for the, the time of the coming of the kingdom. And so you know, Jesus was God, but He was also a good Jew, and so He, you know, he submitted to that. But we rarely remember the idea that Jesus also had to be baptized because it was the fulfillment of the sign for John to know who the Messiah was. So all these things you know, work, work together. So John believed this sign and it began to point to Jesus as the Messiah, the one for whom he was preparing the way. Now John the evangelist introduces John and his story, first example of those who believe. So there's a little bit of background on uh, John, the, uh, John the Baptist. So we pick, up, we pick up the witness of the first believer, John the Baptist, chapter one, verse 19, read along with me. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So the gospel writer introduces John the Baptist uh, in a, with a literary device. Literary device is telescoping. So, so far he's been talking about the big picture, you know, the big picture. Before you know, Jesus or the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. You know what I'm saying? The big picture, the overview. And in, in verse 19 he switches, in one single verse he switches and he telescopes. 
You know, like some movies start like that, a lot of movies start, you know, they're showing big buildings or a plane or you know, the big picture, and then all of a sudden it telescopes to a particular scene, maybe a dialogue between two characters in the movie. So this is what John does. He telescopes down to a particular scene, a particular individual in the story he's going to tell. Uh, and he, uh, he goes directly to an encounter between him, John the Baptist, and the priests and Levites of the time concerning his identity. It's just amazing. You know, if, you, if you look at this as a movie, you know, you're getting this, this, this kind of uh, uh, oh, philosophic, you know, high idea before you know, God was the word, he was with God, so on and so on. And then all of a sudden, boom, the movie starts. And the movie starts with a dialogue between two people, a crowd, you know, John the Baptist there, the priest in their you know, finery and so on and so forth, and saying to him, well, who are you? And so the Baptist's parents and connection to Jesus' family is detailed in Luke, in his gospel. So John kind of skips all of that, goes directly to a certain event in the Baptist's ministry to kick off the story about John the Baptist. So when he talk about the Jews, the Jews are the religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were, a, they were scribes who were zealous in keeping and enforcing the laws. It's like saying, uh, 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 it's like saying um, you know, one of the congressmen is a politician. You know, that's what he is, a politician, a congressman. And then, but he's a Republican, tells you what type of, you know, what, what his ideology is. Well, you know, they were scribes, they were, they were scribes. Uh, lawyers, you know, that's what they were. Scribes were lawyers, transcribed, but they also they interpreted the law for the people. They applied the law in you know, civil situations as well as religious situations. And the Pharisees were scribes who belonged to a particular party, a particular type of scribe, extremely zealous for the law, uh, very, very, uh, well, we get the idea of legalistic from them. And so the priests and the Levites were those who ministered at the temple. So what's, got, what's going on here? John the Baptist, he's drawing crowds. He's proclaiming the imminent coming of the kingdom of God, God's Messiah. And in doing so, he's stirring up the people. People are excited. What's going on? Now the religious leaders, fearing the loss of their position or a backlash from the Roman authorities, they sent a delegation to check out this preacher, this prophet, because what the leaders wanted in Jerusalem was what? What do you think? They wanted peace. They didn't want any trouble. They didn't want anybody rocking the boat. The only reason that they were in charge is because the Romans allowed them to be in charge. At that time, uh, even the high priest was selected by the Roman you know, official who was over that area. And there was a lot of jockeying for position. It was a political position. So they didn't want some rabble rouser coming along and stirring up the people, uh, you know, making trouble. So they go and challenge him. So let's keep reading. Verse uh, 20 to 23. So in response to their question, John makes his witness or confession of belief in the one to come. So first of all, he says in John chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, and he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ, they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, no, I am not. And then they said, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they asked him three questions. They asked if, if he thinks he is the Messiah because there were many religious radicals that claimed this. You know, question number one, are you the Messiah? And he answers no. And there were lots of messiahs. A lot of people came along saying, I'm the messiah, and they would draw a crowd. You know, the best way to draw a crowd in those days was to claim that you were the messiah. So John says, no, I'm, I'm not the messiah. And they asked two more questions. Are you Elijah? And this was a reference to, the, to Malachi chapter four, verse five, where the Old Testament prophets said that Elijah would return as a forerunner of the messiah. So these men, think now, read between the lines, these religious leaders, they knew about the Messiah and they knew about the forerunner and you know that they knew because they asked this question. Are you Elijah? Are you the forerunner? Okay. Now 
They understood there would be a forerunner, but in their understanding it would be some sort of miraculous forerunner. Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, resurrected if you wish. So in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, you know, Jesus explains that John the Baptist was the person that Malachi spoke of, that John the Baptist was indeed a prophet, but he wasn't Elijah, he was in the spirit of Elijah. And we understand what that means. You know, Elijah was a powerful preacher. John the Baptist was a powerful preacher. Elijah was a man of the desert. Well, John the Baptist was a man of the desert. Elijah was a man of vision. Well, John the Baptist was a man of vision. So John the Baptist was in the spirit of Elijah. And so John, knowing their confusion, answers no. He is not the resurrected Elijah, even though he is the fulfillment of the, of the prophecy. You know, they, in effect, when they say, are you Elijah, they weren't, they weren't asking you, are you the forerunner? They're, they're asking me, they were asking him, are you the resurrected Elijah? He said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not that one. And then they asked him another question, are you the prophet? This is a little trickier for us. In Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses said that one day God would raise up a prophet to lead the people just as Moses had led the people. So they wanted to know, did he think of himself as that prophet? And John answers, no, he's not that prophet. Who was the prophet that Moses talked about? Yeah, Christ. Moses was talking about Jesus. He was the prophet that would be raised up and lead the people. So John answers, no, he's not that prophet. We go on in verse 22. And he said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What did you say? Or what do you say about yourself? So they've run out of questions. They've run out of possibilities concerning his identity according to the scriptures. And this was the key. Who he was according to prophecy. If not Christ or Elijah or the prophet, then who are you? Because the Pharisees wanted to know and probably they wanted to know so they could plan an attack against him. You know, for, you know, isn't, that, isn't that the thing that happens in politics? They always want the, uh, the politician, whoever they are, he or she, they want them to kind of state their position on various, you know, agenda, uh, various items. What's your position on the war? What's your position on gays? What's your, what's your position on uh, you know, whatever? The budget. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, they want to know that, not so that they can have an honest discussion. They want to know that so they can do what? Discredit them, attack them. Well, it's the same thing, same old, same old tactic. You know? Solomon said, nothing new under the sun. So in verse 23 we read that, uh, that John says, here's who I am. He says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And what I'm crying out is, make straight the way of the Lord as Isaiah the prophet says. Very interesting. So John responds to their question and he says, I'm two things. One, I'm a voice. Now the significance is that he is a proclaimer and a messenger. In the wilderness refers that his is not a popular message. He's not part of the mainstream. That's what he means when he says, I'm in the wilderness. I'm not part of the mainstream. And then one who makes straight. That's a challenge to them. Uh, he goes against convention. He's here to prepare a new way. The old way was the crooked way. He's here to straighten the way, to prepare the way, to make the way you know, easy to, to, to find. His ministry is spoken of, again, he doesn't mention Elijah or Malachi, he mentions Isaiah. And this is the one who, who, he is, um, who he's quoting. So in verse 24, John the evangelist adds an editorial comment in order to put these questions and motives into context. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So you, if you're a reader, you're going, ah, now I know what's going on. Now, okay, that's why they're asking these questions. Verse 25, they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah? nor the prophet. Here comes the attack. What are they asking him? Is it about baptism? 
Nah. They're saying, where do you get what? Mm-hmm. Where do you, who do you think you are? Where do you get the authority to do this? Their question shows their reaction to John the Baptist and his witness. And according to our themes, what is their reaction? <coughs> we said there are three themes. I'm going to keep coming back to this. So what, what is their reaction? It's a demonstration of what? Disbelief. They don't believe. So they're stung by his message because if he had said he was Elijah, they would have demanded proof through miracles since Elijah did miracles. If he had said he was the prophet, they would have had denounced him as a rabble rouser and reported him to the, to the Roman officials. If he said he was the Christ, they would accuse him of blasphemy or being a lunatic or an imposter. This was a no-win situation with these, uh, with these individuals. So instead, he claims his source for ministry, the prophet Isaiah, who wrote extensively about the coming of the Messiah and also the circumstances surrounding. Isn't it interesting? They were trying to nail him with the scriptures. You have no right, you, know, you can't. So what does he answer with? Well, he answers with the scriptures. So at this point, they become defensive. They don't respond with belief. Instead, they question his authority. If you're not Elijah the prophet, they say, what gives you the right to baptize? And so you know, this is a little insight into human nature, isn't it? When we're challenged with the truth, there's only three ways to respond. All right. Those of you who are parents, you, you, you are very familiar with these three responses. Either you become defensive, you, know, you get mad, you run away, you reject, you deny, 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 deny. Or you rationalize. You give yourself good reasons to disbelieve or disobey. You know, in the recent scandal, the doping scandal in the you know, cycling world, first these guys, what do they do? Deny, 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 deny. Not just for a year, for a decade. Deny, deny, deny. And then once the proof you know, was overwhelming, then what was the next phase? Well, then they said, well, everybody was doing it. I mean, you know, you, we couldn't compete unless we took uh, performance enhancing uh, drugs. Or the third part, the third reaction, submit. Listen carefully, obey the truth, do the right thing. So the reaction of the priests and Levites uh, and by extension the Pharisees, was to become defensive and challenge John's right to baptize, which in essence was challenging and rejecting his, miss, uh, his mission. You don't have any right to baptize. Well, that's the same thing as saying, well, I don't believe you, you have no right, I reject what you're saying. And of course the baptism was simply saying, get ready because the Messiah is coming. And they say, you have no right to baptize, meaning this, this message is not for us. So we keep going, 26. So John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So John replies now to their attitude, rather than to their question, which was, if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet, what gives you the right to baptize? He doesn't even deal with that. They're not believing. So he's not going to keep going with them. In essence, he says to them, yes, I'm baptizing, even though you think I have no right to do so because you don't believe me. And then he goes on the offensive and says, and this is just like you, but there is one here among you today that people like you do not know. You are threatened by what I say and do, but there is one of whom I speak who is so great, the one who threatens you so much, I am not even worthy to enter. Like if you're afraid of me, <laughs> boy, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, if you're getting defensive with my message, wait till he shows up. What will you do? What will you say then? So his reference to the Jordan 
uh, helps situate us to the place where the confrontation. So if you were a filmmaker and you wanted to say, where are we, where are we going to film this scene? Well, we'd film it you know, uh, to something that looks like the Jordan, a river, because it took place where people were being baptized. You can almost imagine, he's doing his work, his ministry, and these guys, the delegation shows up, starts questioning him. All right, so we move on. The gospel writer now describes John the Baptist's own witness about Jesus. And this action takes place after Jesus' baptism, which is described in detail. In a, what's interesting is that in John's gospel, he doesn't describe the baptism of Jesus. You have to go to the other gospels to get the physical description of what happened. So he gives a witness, four elements that John does. Here's his witness. Remember I said he was the first believer? Here's his uh, witness. First of all, in verse uh, 29, he witnesses concerning the purpose of Jesus' coming. Um, in verse 29, he says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus did not come to start a movement, to do miracles, to begin a revolution, or a new philosophy. You know, I spoke to a group of uh, preachers uh, recently and reminded them that our task as the church is not to save the world in the sense of saving the environment. Our task is not to rid the world of poverty. Our task is not to you know, uh, make sure that there are democratic governments all over the world. Those are all good things and worthy things to pursue, of course. But it isn't the task that has been given to the church. The task that's been given to the church is to proclaim the gospel and to call men out of the world to come into the kingdom. Because Jesus said, the poor, you all, you'll always have the poor with you. And He also said, there'll always be wars and rumors of wars. So there's always going to be tornadoes in Oklahoma, there's always going to be a war going on somewhere, and there's always going to be poor people and you know, bad things happening in the world. But our task is to lift up the name of Christ to the world. That doesn't mean we don't help the poor, we're not good stewards of the environment and so on and so forth, but not to the, not to the, uh, 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 the neglect of our main task, which is to proclaim uh, the gospel. And this is what John is doing. Yeah, he's baptizing and so on and so forth, you know, the physical action that he's doing, but what his main task is, is to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he explains that Jesus came to die for men's sin. Everything else serves this purpose. Everything else stems from it. Uh, John came to announce it. The apostles reported it. We remember it. We proclaim it 20 centuries later. So that's what our faith is about. His death for us and what that means for us and the world. That's our message. That's what we do. And unfortunately, there are a lot of churches that forget that. So it's not an either or. We do good works or we pray the uh, preach the gospel. It's, it's both. The second witness, or the second element of his witness, uh, John talks not only about the purpose of Christ's coming, but the character of the one to come in verse 30. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Where, where, what's the problem here? According to what John says. There, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a contradiction here. Go ahead, Jeannie, you said something? Right, he said, you know, he said, he came before me. But John's six months older than Jesus, his second cousin. So how can he be before him? And so by saying that Jesus was before him, he declares that Jesus has a divine nature, not simply a human one. You know, we come into being when our bodies are conceived, but Jesus was alive, existed of course, before his, own, his physical body was conceived. The third element of his witness, the nature of Jesus' ministry. He says, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. So his ministry was to baptize those who believed his preaching and wanted to prepare for the coming one. A lot of people say, why were they baptized? Well, John was preaching, get ready, this is the age of the Messiah, this is when the Messiah is coming. And those who believed that message were baptized to demonstrate that they were preparing themselves for that. Now, 
today, the same baptism exists, right? The same form, you know, there's water, a person is immersed in the water, but, but, but the reason is different, isn't it? We're not being baptized today to prepare for the coming. Today, God Himself, through Christ and the apostles, have, has given baptism a different significance. Today, someone who comes forward to be baptized is doing so in order to confess their faith in Christ. You know, he, said, uh, he or she says, I believe in Jesus, right? And Jesus said, prove it. <laughs> and so a person is immersed in the water. And at that moment, that individual's sins are forgiven, that individual receives the Holy Spirit, that individual is guaranteed eternal life. So same format, different purpose, okay? And then, um, sorry, where, where are we? The third one, okay. Um, uh, so, so John here, let me get back to John. Baptism was the dividing line, not only for those who believe, but also for anyone who claimed to be the Messiah. So both the believer and the object of belief would ultimately receive baptism. Je Jesus was baptized. Uh, sometimes people say, well, why should I? I don't see the need for it. And I'm thinking, well, it's a good thing Jesus didn't say that. My response is always, well, if the, if the Lord Himself submitted to that, why, why would I rebel against such a thing? You know? All right, number four. He says, uh, John's witness contains the source of his ministry. That's the other element, 32 to 34. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and He re remained upon Him. So you see, remember I told you, how would He know which, which one of the hundreds or thousands of people that He baptized, how would He know which one was the Messiah? <coughs> well, He knew, He says, I have seen the Spirit de descending as a dove out of heaven. Once He saw that, then He knew. 33, it says, I did not recognize him, but he who sent him to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So John is testifying to how he knew which one. You know, he says it himself. He says, I did not recognize him. With my own eyes, with my fleshly eyes, I, you know, look for a guy who's got a big nose, or look for a, you know, a really tall guy, you know, or whatever. You know, the, I, with my eyes, with my fleshly eyes, I could not recognize him. God gave him a supernatural uh, signal, if you wish, to look for, that he would see and that would be performed to identify who the uh, Christ is. Then he says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So John was recognized as special from his birth. People wondered how God would use him. And in this passage, he claims the authority of a prophet based on what he has received from the Lord. You know, think about the time here. Um, it has been 400 years since the last legitimate prophet spoke in Israel. That was Malachi. That's a long time between prophecies for a nation, for a people that were, was used to receiving messages uh, from God, from prophets. 400 years. Uh, but it's nothing new, right? The Jews were familiar with the presence of inspired men speaking from God. It wasn't new among them. So John says that God gave him his ministry and the sign to identify the one for whom he was preparing would be evident. And he says the sign was the Spirit descending and remaining on one individual, he would be the one. Now in Matthew 3.16, Matthew describes this very scene, right? A dove descending on Jesus, a voice from heaven declaring his sonship. So that scene was the fulfillment of the sign that John looked for, and we've, I mentioned this in another class. What's interesting, the only place in the Bible where all three persons in the Godhead are visually represented. The Father with the voice, the Son in the, in the form of, of Jesus, the human, the God-man, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Only place in the Bible where you see all three elements present, visual, uh, uh, visible, uh, to an individual and to, our, to ourselves. All right, so John says that the fulfillment of this sign was the proof to him that Jesus was indeed the God-man, the Messiah. 
So John acknowledges that he had a sign from God to direct him to the true Messiah and it was given. Okay, so that's John's story in the book of John or the Gospel of John. So we have our first episode where John entwines all three of his themes. Let's just go over it a little bit here. First of all, he explains how John the Baptist was alerted to Jesus' coming, the supernatural sign that John himself was looking for to confirm that the individual he baptized was indeed the Messiah. Secondly, we get the first examples of disbelief among the Pharisees and the priests who challenged John's authority to baptize, which indirectly disregarded his message. Uh, they refused to be baptized. And the way they said it was, you have no authority, who gave you the authority? We're not going to be baptized by you. And then the third strand, Jesus, uh, excuse me, John the Baptist shown as the first true believer in Jesus, the God-man. We see him explaining the things, the signs that led. And so in this description of John the Baptist's ministry, John sets forth yet another claim of Jesus' divine nature, and he, prov and he provides two variations, right? One of disbelief at first, and then one of belief with John the Baptist. So next week, um, we're going to uh, uh, move on in our, in our study. If, if you've just joined this week, I want to remind you, this is a textual study. This is not a topical. A topical study is we, we pick some topics out of John and we kind of zero in on them. This is a textual study. This is a bit longer. It's line by line, verse by verse. You know, we're going to do every single chapter throughout the book of John. And hopefully when we're done, if God is willing, we get through all of it, uh, you'll have a good grasp of this particular gospel. You'll really understand it and understand the purpose for it and how John, uh, the a gospel writer, achieves his, uh, his goals in it.